Okay, well, we've got a few people come through, so um, let's get started. Um, welcome. My name is uh, Chris Lethbridge. I'm Director of Member Programs here at the China Britain Business Council, um, and you've joined us today for a, a discussion about China's reopening uh, and the opportunities that presents uh, for, for British businesses in 2023. Uh, so just very briefly, um, we've got uh, kind of two halves of today. First half, we're joined um, by my uh, colleagues, um, Kieran Patel uh, and Mark Harrison from KPMG, just to give us an overview of, of kind of how things are tracking uh, in, in China in terms of China's reopening. Uh, and in the second half of uh, th this morning, um, we're joined by uh, my sector colleagues based in in throughout China, actually, um, and they're going to be providing, providing a sector by sector update on, on what's happening uh, over the next 12 months or so. Um, so I'll, I'll first, uh, hand over to Kieran shortly, but just, um, you know, briefly introduce Mark. Um, so Mark is a partner at KPMG China, um, which he joined in, in 2008, and he works on deal advisory, um, including M&A, due diligence and, and other assistance for businesses. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to, to my colleague, Kieran. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for making the time to join this session. Um, I'm going to keep my comments short as we've got a, a lot to get through today. But you know, we felt it was a timely opportunity to bring you all together for an update on China's reopening, show an outlook on how things are shaping up, for your plans to engage with the markets here, and present a series of dates that would be worth locking into your diaries for the year ahead. CBBC is therefore delighted to have uh, Mark Harrison give a perspective from KPMG on this subject, and also the heads of all of our sector teams in China to present a program of opportunities that they are working on. The transition from strict zero COVID measures to complete reopening has been swift, and it remains to be seen very much what the year ahead will bring for businesses and organizations that deal with China. But CBBC and most experts are generally quite optimistic. CBBC, uh, China's reopening took us all somewhat by surprise, and the past month has been spent positioning the work we do at CBBC to respond as effectively as possible to the shift in policy so that you, our members, clients, and partners are able to harness the CBBC platform effectively. On the 3rd of December, I gave an outlook update on China's zero COVID policy from my bedroom in Beijing at uh, our education forum which has thankfully aged like milk. Back then, CBBC couldn't see any immediate term shift towards a reopening of borders and a fluid environment that would be conducive to business. We have, however, come a very, very long way since then. Since the 8th of January, 2023, when China ended the quarantine regime for international arrivals that have been in place for nearly three years, as you all know, um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, we are now seeing the return of direct flights between the UK and China with announcements from both British Airways and Virgin this week on a very strong resumption of service, verging into Shanghai from the 1st of May and British Airways from flights to Shanghai from the 23rd of April and Beijing from the 3rd of June. Emirates uh, were, um, are even earlier and will, as of March the 15th, be operating 21 weekly flights into the Chinese mainland via Dubai, into Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. China is open for business. It will take some time for full capacity to be reached with respect to travel um, due to factors such as oper operationalizing airport terminals, retraining staff. But what we are seeing is very, very encouraging. Domestic restrictions have also been lifted, allowing the resumption of in-person events and travel within the country. I, for example, am in the middle now of um, a four city tour around the Pearl River Delta this week and have literally just uh, a few minutes ago arrived in CBBC Shanghai office. The last time I was here, upon return to Beijing, I was put into central quarantine for two weeks, which held me back from making any trips out of Beijing um, since the best part of November 2021. Um, while on my travels this week, I'm pleased to report that there have been very few signs, if, if any sign of the zero COVID infrastructure that was put in place to control the spread of the virus through um, controlling travel. Trains are full, airports and high-speed rail terminals bustling with people, returning both from the Lunar New Year break and getting back on the case with, uh, with respect to, to, to doing business. I've had productive and forward-looking meetings that have led to direct outcomes I've met companies and officials who are excited about the prospect of engaging directly with UK businesses once again, 
We've discussed delegation visits both ways, events, investment programs, and a plethora of ideas geared towards stimulating the business environment for UK companies. I'm filled with genuine optimism, as you can probably see, that we will have a normalized operational environment this year. Our team, therefore, is building a range of initiatives across all sectors for you to tap into. Our UK-China Business Forum on the 15th of March in London will further present this uh, evolving environment and market dynamic. CBBC China Consumer 2023 is at an advanced stage of development. Our China Business Guide is being prepared for publication. Our visa support uh, letter support service is also at your disposal, as are all of our events and services. Our team will run you through all those today after Mark um, with, um, with their comprehensive practical business program that is shaping up well. I probably said a bit too much, so I'm going to stop there. And I'm now going to hand over to Mark Harrison, who's going to uh, to take it on from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, just to add, I'm based in, in Shanghai, although I've just come back from a six week trip to Europe, which uh, was interesting to see the, uh, the contrasts uh, in terms of the way China is being is being viewed. I, I will put up a, a, a slide here, more of talking points whilst we're going through this. Um, I think um, maybe a quick recap for the benefit of everybody. I appreciate some people may be in China and others elsewhere. Um, like Kieran, I've been in, in Shanghai throughout the, the zero COVID time. You know, before the 8th of December, we were having to do PCR tests almost every day at the cabin at the end of your street. Um, to get into an office or a restaurant or a shop or a gym or a cinema, you, you had to scan the door. Uh, you were normally being checked to make sure that you had had an up-to-date PCR test as well. It was very prohibitive. Uh, domestic travel was very complicated. People were living in, well, they, they were concerned about the risks of, of lockdown of being put into quarantine, so either into the, what we call the Fangsang, so the local uh, quarantine centers um, within the cities, if you were um, either positive or a contact case, or the quarantine centers when you flew into the country, which um, I, I had the, uh, the pleasure of experiencing last summer when I returned to the UK for a month and then came back and spent 10 days in a, in a quarantine hotel, which was, not pleasant, would not recommend it. The, the important thing to say here is that as of the 8th of December, all of that, pretty much all of it, disappeared overnight. There was no more testing, there was no more scanning, uh, there were no more quarantines, there were no more risks of lockdown. It changed immediately overnight. Um, I was here for about four or five days um, with at that time before I flew to the UK. And I got back two weeks ago during Chinese New Year. And it was fascinating to see how that's changed as I was coming into Pudong. Um, Pudong Airport felt like it was three years ago. Uh, it was busy, it was bustling. There was a huge line of drivers waiting there to pick everybody up. Um, you didn't obviously have, obviously didn't have to do any quarantine. Um, quarantining, you didn't have to do any other testing, you could go straight home. Um, just for, for reference, if anyone is planning to travel here, you do need to do a PCR test before you leave. Um, that's pretty straightforward and you have to do a kind of self-declaration where you scan a QR code. But it's all pretty straightforward and um, I think it's going to make it a lot easier <clears throat> for people coming into China. It's maybe worth, I mean, Whilst I was in Europe, I, I had a lot of client meetings and a lot, a lot of people questioned why this has happened. They can see the positives, but they want to understand it better. There is a kind of conventional wisdom that I saw across Europe, um, perhaps coming from the media, where people believe that this change with the zero COVID policy was due to the protests that occurred in various cities around China. That, that was certainly part of it, but I don't think it's the only reason. I think the major reasons were really that COVID was already getting out of control in the bigger cities, especially Beijing and Guangzhou. 
the cost of supporting zero COVID was unsustainable. It's hundreds of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on that to the extent that um, local authorities were unable to pay the testing companies. There was high unemployment, especially amongst the young, and the government was clearly concerned about the economy. I mean, we could see that at KPMG in our own business, second half of last year, you could see the way that all of our clients, whether they're local Chinese, uh, multinationals, state-owned enterprises, all of them were, were, were clearly being very careful. Um, so moving into where we are today, um, what, before coming back, I was unsure what I would see when I got back. I knew from speaking to friends, colleagues, clients here in China that clearly many people got sick. As you've, you've heard these numbers, like 80% of people caught COVID. Um, anecdotally, I, I would confirm that. I think it's probably even over 90%. And secondly, I think that 90% plus of COVID uh, cases and infections all happened in the second, well, let's say during December. In different cities, Beijing was earlier, Shanghai was later. But by the end of December, um, a large portion of the population had been infected. And interestingly, it had also spread very, very quickly to lower tier cities and the countryside. There was um, a concern that there was going to be some kind of second wave as people went into the spring festival, traveling back to their hometowns, and then maybe that would cause a second wave coming back. Um, it seems that's been avoided. Um, also a concern, I think, that given the experience that people had been through during that month, um, obviously concerns about their own health, loss of family members, that there could be uh, a reaction to that. Um, what I've seen in the last few weeks is that people are responding positively. There's a very high level of energy. It's vibrant. Um, the shops and the restaurants are very busy. The metro is very busy. The airports are very busy. People are traveling. As um, Kieran said in his opening remarks, I, I really feel um, China is back back in business um, and open for business, more importantly, as well. Um, perhaps just looking back to last year, I, um, I had many conversations with our clients and contacts locally in Shanghai, so especially executives of MNCs. And it was interesting that despite the many challenges that we had in 2022, their um, financial performance was actually better than they expected. In, in most cases, people were telling me they expected to miss budgets, top line budget by about 10%, although a bottom line would be a little bit worse given um, costs of inflation, especially of labor costs, commodities and energy. Um, and even before, this was before the relaxation of the policies, they were still um, remaining very committed uh, going into 2023. They were telling me that they were going to uh, maintain their investments and um, they were probably going to revise their budgets down slightly, but generally things were going to continue. And certainly um, in the meetings I've had in the last week or two since I got back, I would very much confirm that line of thinking. In, in line with that, um, it's worth mentioning that the Chinese government is clearly trying to put out a positive message to multinationals. Um, you may have heard about a number of um, changes or announcements in the last month or so, where government representatives have, have explained that they're keen to attract multinationals to do more investment, um, they've reduced the negative list. And just in the last few days, I've had calls from my colleagues here in China where, you know, for example, uh, being contacted by the local government in Shenzhen, um, asking us for our help to identify foreign businesses who are willing to, you know, who want to invest around Shenzhen and that they're willing to give various forms of subsidies and tax incentives, et cetera. Uh, to encourage investment there. 
I think that probably shows how concerned the government was about the state of the economy last year, and perhaps w which led them to change policy on, on zero COVID so suddenly, um, realizing that they really wanted to get uh, the foreign businesses focused on China again. Now, I, I appreciate um, for any of our clients when they talk about China investment, it's it's a careful balance between the geopolitical situation and the investment opportunities, which is a careful balancing act and, and is changing all the time. I am um, the other signal I've seen in the last few months is that excuse me, last few weeks, is the number of clients who are telling me that their foreign executives are planning to visit China. Even whilst I was still in Europe, people were telling me that they were starting to make plans. And I think we're going to expect to see a lot of senior executives coming in during March and April who really, you know, they're desperate to see what's going on in a number of ways. I guess on the one hand, perhaps there's a few problems that they've seen in their business that they want to understand and address. And I think they genuinely want to see how the market's changed here and what investment opportunities there are. We've, um, for the last three years, given the travel restrictions, um, many companies have put projects on hold. There have been some larger investments that went ahead, uh, including greenfield um, construction, but in general, that slowed down. Um, also, I think looking ahead for, in terms of the economy, um, a lot of discussion about so-called revenge spending um, and whether that will happen or not. I think the general consensus consensus is yes. And certainly in terms of what we're seeing so far, that would appear to be the case. But to give you some idea of how much money is involved, I've seen different estimates of anywhere between two and four trillion dollars as being the amount of excess cash that's been saved up in China during COVID. And that that is larger than the GDP, the annual GDP of the UK. So that's a huge amount of money that can be spent. Um, and I think realistic, you know, I think we can we can hope um, that in FY23, if we see some of that cash being spent, it's going to lead to a boost in uh, the contribution of of consumers to, to overall GDP. Um, of course, last year, the final GDP number was uh, 3%. Um, disappointing, but understandable given everything that happened. And currently, I think the estimates from different sources are maybe between 5 and, and maybe even up to 6% GDP growth for this year. And that's with, I mean, this is coming from many of the analysts who have really baked in the expectation that the economy will bounce back this year. Two other points to mention. I think um, geopolitics always changes, you know, constantly changing, very, very complicated. Um, I think in, in January, we saw two positive signs, uh, which I'll come back to. And unfortunately, I think this issue around the uh, the air balloon in, in the US has probably created some, some uh, un, un, uh, unneeded, let's say, tension. Um, got to be resolved. But we saw during uh, January a couple of changes in the political team. Um, you know, for example, the person who was the uh, point man on uh, China-Russia uh, diplomacy changed position. And also um, one of the other diplomats who had been accused of being a, a bit overly aggressive in terms of communication. So perhaps going forward, we'll see a reduction in tension. Um, you know, it's a shame that Anthony Blinken's visit to China has been uh, been cancelled, but hopefully uh, we can get that, you know, that, that, um, that goodwill will we'll get going again in the next few months. A final point to talk about was supply chain, which I think is, is a really hot topic. Uh, I talk to different people all the time about this. Um, I think um, the way we see it with supply chain is there's kind of three groups of companies or, or parts of companies. There is China for China, there's China for global, 
and this sourcing. If we're talking about China for China, which is the, I mean, if we're talking about M&A, the, 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 the largest part of the investment that we see, um, I don't see any change. I think um, any multinational who is manufacturing in China using raw materials sourced in China to sell to Chinese consumers, there's no real need to make a move. Um, on the on the China for global, I, I do think we'll see some moves there. Uh, I, I know of a number of companies who had difficulties during the Shanghai lockdown, where um, the the interruption caused caused big difficulties and challenges for their global supply chain. Uh, a number of sectors that had large production sites in China, and they were then unable to fulfill orders around the world for their uh, clients overseas, their customers overseas, which then led their competitors jumping in and were able to fulfill those orders. Um, and I, I certainly see companies starting to, to look at that. The third group, sourcing, is where we're seeing the largest movement at the moment, probably because it's the easiest and it's where you can quite clearly explain it in the context of trying to reduce dependency on China. Um, for your, for your for your goods. Um, but the work we've been doing so far, we're seeing that there are challenges. To, to share some examples, we've, um, for example, my, my colleagues in, um, in Southeast Asia have done various projects for clients trying to identify new suppliers of raw material in those countries. And they've found a number of challenges. One of them being that you can find an alternative supplier in, for example, a country like Vietnam, um, and it will be a genuine Vietnamese company and it's located in Vietnam and it can supply the materials. But in many cases, we then find that the owners are Chinese and perhaps that doesn't really achieve the objective of the, of the company. Second thing that can happen is that although the company could well be the supplier is based in Vietnam, Vietnamese, Vietnamese owned. In, in other cases, we then find that that supplier's tier two or tier three component suppliers are coming from China. So very difficult to address this problem and, and we'll have to see what's, uh, what's happening going forward. So maybe to, to wrap up, I think there's been a very sudden change. I feel here locally, people are adapting to that and moving on very quickly. I think we're going to see a ramp up of economic activity um, during the year. I do think it's going to take at least a quarter for all of this to be digested. So I think it's more looking at Q2, Q3 that we'll see it strongly in the GDP numbers. And I can see already that our MNC foreign clients already looking at China through a different lens. Um, in the last Three years it's perhaps seen as a bit of a black box in the sense that can't see in, don't know what's going on and therefore it seems problematic. But I think as we've seen visitors coming in over the next few months, they're going to be excited about the opportunities here and assuming that the geopolitical tensions can be managed, we'll see a lot more um, activity going forward. So thanks for your time. I think we can, I, I will take down my slides, happy to open up for some discussion uh, or any questions. You have. Mark, thank you very, very much for that. We're actually going to keep the, the Q&A towards the end, but um, it, it's an excellent reminder uh, to use the Q&A function um, on your screen and then um, we'll collect them up and have a bit of a, a conversation um, after my colleagues um, have, have presented. But yeah, once again, thank you for that tour de force of of all things China. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Um, okay, so as I, as I mentioned, the second half, we're going to be getting an update from our colleagues uh, based on the ground in China. Um, and first of all, I'd like to hand over to, to Ran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, hello, everyone. So um, I, my name is Ran. So I lead CBBC's consumer sector here in China. So I'm based in Beijing. Um, so within the consumer sector, we have three very exciting um, kind of subsectors, including food and drink, and then retail and e-commerce, and also creative and sports. 
um, we have uh, project managers and then uh, uh, and sector leads um, based in Beijing and Shanghai, and also we have a team in the UK. So um, yeah, so uh, entering 2023, I think we we can finally. Um, I'm happy and confident to say to, to say that China is finally post COVID. We can plan um, our strategies and events uh, according to that new, new change. Um, so I think consumer sector of all is, is probably the most dynamic sector in, in CBBC where, you know, there's a lot of exciting events and trade shows and changes take place very quickly. Um, so during my session, I'm just going to kind of um, go through the, the potentials that within the sector that we, we have discovered and then also our events calendar for the year and um, to introduce some of our um, services. So... Um, yeah, so let's um, let's start with the with the food and drink um, sector. Um, so one of one of the key trends that we have observed in the food and drink sector is that people are are are, are demanding for for change, right? There's a lot of demands on, on fusion and discovery, new taste that can satisfy the taste buds. Um, you know, during the lockdowns and during COVID, people are kind of bored with with you know what, what they cook at home. So there's a lot of uh, interesting, innovative new products. You're just you know. Um, drinks and, and food um, with alcohol in them. You know, we have alcoholic ice, ice cream, alcoholic tea and, and biscuits. And then there's also sparkling everything, sparkling drinks, sparkling waters, sparkling wines that um, we see that are developed by both international and Chinese brands. And also there's a lot of IP collaborations of uh, brands uh, from different sectors. And people are paying increasingly more attention on, on the beauty um, and, and health and the wellness uh, on on themselves and also their their families, so um, food and drink products with uh, health benefit benefits are, are growing more um, popular. Um, you know we have new products like the collagen gummies and vitamin sweets, bell pro, um, probiotic, new lollipops, and then other healthy snacks that are that are leading um, the trend. So these are the trends that have been developed during the COVID period, and we think they are going to continue in the next couple of years. And if you go to the next slide, we can see that um, this trend is, is continued, uh, that we see products also with low in everything. Um, people are looking for products that are low in fat, low in sugar, and offer low or zero calories. And, uh, you know, we, we know the zero calorie sparkling water, um, Genki Forest have, have been very popular, uh, leading the sector for many years. And generally, uh, we think, you know, these products are targeting female consumers. And there's this very popular concept of the she economy that has been dominating the market. You know, we have we have 400 million more um, Chinese female consumers that are crazy about healthier snacks. And um, also during the COVID, du during the lockdown period, there's also the development of the three R's, which is ready to cook, ready to heat and ready to eat products. There's self-heated everything. We see self-heated hot pot, self-heated rice, self-heated noodles that would be very convenient to for one to prepare um, quickly at home or at work. So we think this is also a trend that's going to continue in the next, uh, next years to come. And uh, diving into the retail space, so we think really the theme um, that has been developed during the last couple of years is to seize the moment while you can and to please oneself in many different aspects and to pay more attention on both the physical and mental well-being of oneself. It's, um, you know, increasingly we see people are willing to spend more money to take care of their themselves, to enjoy, um, you know, um, a spa at home, for example, or to kind of... Uh, to purchase very um, best bulk customized fragrance products. So we think, um, you know, the beauty sector, the skincare or, or the cosmetic sector ha still have a lot of potentials and this cover beauty sector for both men uh, and, and women. So there's a, um, a lot of potential in the, in the male beauty sector as well, although it's not there, but it's catch catching up very quickly and people are paying a lot of attention on their physical um, well-being as well. They're joining more outdoor activities, um, they're doing more exercises. So for sports brands and, and brands that offer uh, kind of sports a lifestyle, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity there as, as well. And, uh, you know, dur during COVID people are forced to spend a lot of times, um, you know, at home. So there's the, the homeware sector. 
um, has seen a, a lot of growth um, together with the pet sector. So there's um, people are you know uh, are purchasing more pet products for their dogs, their cats, and then um, you know they're treating their pets as, as their families and friends. They're willing to to increase their life standard as well. Um, so this, this is still a blue sea. With we think there's a lot of um, opportunities in, in the pet sector in, in general. So here um, I'm pleased to kind of present a, a consumer sector calendar, which uh, includes the key events and trade shows and our initiatives in both retail and the food and drink sector. As you can see, it's a very busy year ahead. I think our focus is really mainly in two areas. On the B2B side, we are very keen to embrace the trade shows. Um, that are hopefully, um, you know, going to take place. There will be no kind of postponement, um, you know, no cancellation, last minute change or anything. So also we're very keen to welcome uh, um, the clients and delegations from the UK, if not in the first year, uh, first half of this year, hopefully in the second half of this year. And, um, you know, on the B2C side, we're very keen to increase exposure of British consumer brands in general to Chinese consumers. We're, we're very keen to promote the concept of brand Britain as a whole, for example. So just to go through very quickly the key events um, throughout the year, um, one of the events you can see that, that it's going to go through, uh, you know, the whole year is our Brands of Britain tour, which is a um, CBBC key consumer sector events that we're going to um, visit a number of multinational companies and large Chinese companies and, uh, and take a number of um, British consumer brands with us. So in January um, to March, basically in this uh, quarter, we're going to work with Seafood Scotland to do a seafood market update and matchmaking for the um, Scottish seafood exporters. And uh, we have the China Fashion Week that's also um, in March. And we have the China Cultural Literacy Training in February 22nd. This is the offline event in the UK. And uh, in, in April to June, this is the busiest kind of uh, trade show season. A lot of the consumer sector trade shows, including CL in Shanghai, that's a key uh, food and drink show, and a number of shows in the, cons uh, in the retail sector, including the CBE, China Beauty Expo, um, you know, the Consumer Expo in Hainan, um, Design Shanghai, Basel British is going to return this year as well. And then also there's a children and baby maternity expo, CBME, um, that's that's going to take place. And SPO show is a, is a show in sports sector. And um, in July to September, um, we're going to have our signature CBBC consumer event um, offline in London. That's our China Consumer 2023. It's set to take place um, on the 4th and 5th of July. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that one. And um, there's also the Pet Fair Asia taking place in Shanghai. And we're talking with a number of uh, luxury hotel groups with the aim to collaborate with them um, in summertime to provide um, showcasing and trial opportunities for British consumer brands to, to the, the customers and guests of these hotels. And in October and December, we have the CIE um, and we have the hotel and uh, food and hospitality show FHC in Shanghai, and we have the Shanghai Fashion Week. So upcoming events. So um, China Consumer 2023 is definitely one of our key consumer sector events. So this is CBBC's um, annual flagship event for UK consumer brands to get on top of current consumer trends, regulations, key areas of, of opportunities and, and topics. Um, it will be held in a central place in London, but it will be a hybrid event where we'll invite Chinese uh, retailers, um, speakers um, and Chinese brands to join the session and share their experience and insights with uh, UK brands that have been very successful in the consumer space in China. And um, if you are new to China or you have been away from the China market for, for some time, join us um, on 22nd of February uh, in, in the UK um, at our China Cultural Literacy, which will be de delivered together by the CBBC consumer team in the UK and then our um, members, Tone Digital. Um, we'll share a lot of uh, topics about the cons consumer trends and then the, the new consumer profiles and then to just, um, get you on top of um, what's popular in China. So um, 
ahead of uh, on top of all the other services that we offer. Um, we also con will continue to offer um, produce content and offer compliance registration services to our members. So the, the food and drink sector and the retail sector, we produce uh, sector newsletters on a quarterly basis. I think for the retail sector, it's a monthly basis. Um, so if you are our members, you should be able to get these um, these mailings. If not, do let us know. And uh, we offer GACC manufacturer registration service for food and drink companies, and then also the cosmetics ingredient filing with the NMPA for um, retail clients. So I think I think that's that's all. Um, that's consumer sector in a nutshell. I will stop here and then let our colleagues from other sectors who share other, other um, interesting comments. Thank you for that, Ryan. Um, so just handing uh, handing over to Isabel um, from the the education sector. Sorry, uh, Isabel. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Isabel, and I'm look after the knowledge economy sector in CBBC China, mainly for education. So, when we talk about education culture, these kind of uh, businesses, this is mainly about perceptions. So, I would like to highlight the importance of people-to-people -people exchange. And thanks to the resumption of international travels, it is foreseeable to have many delegation visits, flying faculties, and face-to-face -face meetings this year. And regardless of the challenges, UK-China education partnerships continue to evolve, and the public is playing an increasingly important role in the people-to-people -people relations. The sector will continue to be impacted by geopolitics factors, but when we look at the relationship through the lens of trade and culture and education and people-to-people -people perspective, the relationship could as strong as it's ever it's been. So as far as, as I know, it seems like there will be ministerial visits this year, so hopefully this will lead to more stability in the UK-China relationship, which are positive political signals to the sector performance in the future. And when all goes to all, the statistics you now can see on the screen, the statistics will often remind people of why our relationship with China, from inward student recruitment to research collaborations, that China is too big to fail and too important to ignore. And this is a very good opportunity now for institutions to well plan this year and to really get smart in working with China. So universities, please be get ready and build up your own expertise to understand how to work with China. And the latest announcement by, made by the Ministry of Education two weeks ago, very lately, clarified that Chinese students will only be attested for their degrees received on overseas campus. So when they return to China, this is suggesting a return of normality and this is a promise made by the government to support Chinese students to have a quality education overseas. So everything will be back to normal. And in light of the resumption to normality, businesses in the UK should anticipate the growth in the number of Chinese students and visitors. And these services relate relevant to study abroad support, application, international travel, and on-campus service. And tourism, of course, is also relevant to be expected to grow, and particularly from summertime to the start of the term in the autumn. We're also expecting more guidance from the Chinese authority on group student visits overseas, as they are the majority of summer school participants in the past. So here on the slides, I highlight this is mainly the business met here now is mainly for um, the adult student, and because uh, there are a lot of concerns for young students well-being so young students maybe um, will happen later but adult students will have no doubt it is clear that the, the the adult students will have the freedom to choose their short study program overseas and whenever it is appropriate so together with cbdbc there will be a number of key organizers in the market that you may have already know here as i listed in the in this in this form um and these important events are what I would recommend for your awareness. So people-to-people -people exchanges are of utmost importance for the sector. So we have seen the large-scale events postponed last year now have been confirmed and hosted offline um, in the first quarter of this year. For example, the China Annual Conference and Expo for International Education, CACIE 2022, um, which Will be which should happen in last November. Now is going to take place in Beijing just next week. As you could see from the calendar, 
the key events organized by the major international education sector, such as the British Council, CEAIE, Times Higher Education, have now brought back to normality throughout the year. From March to the end, sometimes uh, some events haven't been decided at the time yet, but we can. It is foreseeable that it will happen this year. And here I would like to point out the key events that we do uh, together with our partners. For example, in March, the Alpadi, which is a professional training program for architects, will start in Shanghai. This is a cooperative education model we built together with Riba and with a few um, industrial partners. This is suggesting the continuous professional development value for industrial professionals. And we are happy to work with more industrial partners and associations, if you like, to create more opportunities in other industries as such. We also have key events taking place in the UK. The UK-China Business Forum is a flagship event organized by CBBC, uh, which Kieran mentioned earlier. And there is a session on sustainability of UK-China education partnerships for discussion. There are more details on the event website, so if you'd like to hear more, you may wish to check it out. In the past, we have a Cambridge International Education Seminar every year, but we stopped it for, uh, for a while due to the COVID. So we are now planning to resume this event in, this year in the UK and bringing back faculties from top universities in both countries to discuss the development in teaching of the cutting edge technologies. And research and innovation is highly relevant to the sector. Times Higher Education, as you can see on the, on the form, has set its Innovation and Impact Summit in Shenzhen, China, later this year in November, suggesting the flourishing of the business in the region. In fact, CBBC has a dedicated um, Great Bay Area, GBA, we call it, GBA program to respond to the needs of business, and my colleague Tina will introduce that part in her presentation. So that's from my side. Thank you, Isabel. Um, let me hand over now to, to Mark Xu, um, talking about the industrial sector. Mark? Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. This is Mark. And I've been introduced, I look after the what we call the industrial economies, which uh, is very, very broad and covers anything from advanced manufacturing to transport, energy, infrastructure, and healthcare and life sciences as well. So today, I'm just going to highlight a few key subsectors where we believe there'll be real opportunities and growth this year in China. Just a, a, an overall uh, outlook, the economy, uh, economic activities in China has expanded for the first time in four months as the uh, PMI rose quite sharply last month, which is quite surprising since the second half of January uh, was the Chinese New Year. So the index increased by 3.1% from 47 to 50 reflecting quite a strong growth momentum of China's economy after the, uh, the epidemic prevention and, and control policies introduced in November last year. And as we know, anything over 50 on that index indicates a market expansion. Um, the integrated semiconductor sector is probably the single um, sector where China is heavily investing to improve its own chip making equipment developments following the US sanctions. Um, there are a number of well-developed semiconductor equipment manufacturers are you know, growing uh, and, and emerge in China, but they are always obviously open to work with international partners to build up its own supply chain and being self-reliant. Okay, next page. Right, advanced manufacturing, uh, key state and provincial investment continue to pour into intelligent and uh, Automatic uh, manufacturing projects centering around the three state level uh, industry clusters, one in the Jingjingji area, which is from Beijing, Hebei, Tianjin area, where I'm based, the Yangtze River Belt, which is all the way uh, along the Yangtze River, but probably there's two hubs in, in that area, the what we call the CCC, the Chongqing Chengdu Circle, centering around Chongqing, and uh, um, obviously Shanghai, Jiangsu, and, and Zhejiang. Uh, as well as obviously the, the Greater Bay Area. So for example, in the first half of 2022, a total of 25 advanced manufacturing mini clusters in these regions achieved a out, uh, total output of 6.2 trillion RMB. Automotive, which is probably the single largest export sector from the UK to China over the years. 
Uh, in terms of policy, um, obviously the Chinese government extended the tax exemption for NEV customers back in January 2022 for an additional two years to help to achieve the 20% NEV deployment by 2025. So by the end of this year, we'll find out if the policy will be further extended. But my guess is probably it wouldn't, as the current figure is already approaching 16%. Uh, in terms of EV sales, um, the latest figure, oh, sorry, let's go back to the previous page. Um, figures from CAM, which is the China Association for Automotive Manufacturers, predicts that Chinese and EV sales in 2023 would grow by 35% to 9 million units. Um, the top selling Chinese EV brands last month uh, was BYD with 150,000 vehicles, which actually far exceeds. Uh, number two and uh, number three on the list, which are Li Auto with 15,000 and uh, Guangzhou Auto with 10,000. And in terms of NEV ownership, uh, Shanghai leads the way with 1 million uh, current registered vehicles, and NEV contributed to 53% of all new vehicles registered in 2022 in the city. And, and obviously, Shanghai, along with Beijing and the tier one cities, have better. Um, charging infrastructure to facilitate this uh, this growth. Um, right, transport. Overall outlook for China's logistics sector is rather positive in 2023 after the Chinese New Year. Costs will uh, keep decreasing and shipment speed will increase due to faster customs clearances in China. There may be some challenges in shipping lines and routes but we can expect the situation to largely go back to pre-COVID uh, times, which is actually a positive sign for both importers and exporters. Next page, please. Thanks. Obviously, following COP27, China is continuing its promotion for energy transition as the world's largest developing country and largest energy consumer. China has increased its efforts to invest in renewable energy, but also making sure its continued development of its traditional uh, coal-fired power plants um, as it needs to balance net zero targets with ensuring the country's uh, energy security. Key regions such as was mentioned earlier uh, include Yangtze River Delta and Greater Bay Area leads lead the promotion for low carbon development and energy transformation and CBBC actually will be participating in one of those events in May during the China Green Industrial Forum in Guangzhou. Infrastructure, the construction industry expected to register an average uh, growth rate of 4.4% from 23 to 2026, uh, as supported by investments on infrastructure projects as part of the 14th five-year plan. Uh, this is also a, C, a key sector for China. Uh, as uh, China, as mentioned, hope to grow its GDP uh, by above 5,000 this year. Uh, this is quite particularly important as the real uh, estate sector is still going through what we call a probably a correction phase. Right, healthcare and life sciences. Um, the size of China's population, especially the country's rapidly aging population, coupled with the uh, burden and Healthcare spending suggests the opportunities are plenty for, for international companies. The um, long term outlook for China's healthcare is underpinned by its aging population. About 25% of the population of China will be classified as elderly. This is um, an above 60 years old by 2023. And by 2035, China's senior citizen will be uh, expected to reach over 400 million, representing 28. Um, percent of the po total population. Um, the aging population demand, uh, obviously it's very high for, for chronic disease management uh, and, and other preventive health cares. So healthcare spending, however, represents currently just 5% of China's GDP in 2016, uh, significantly less than that of the US, which is currently around 17%. And as China's um, consumer pattern converge with the developed markets, uh, we uh, estimate the healthcare spending could reach to 2.5 trillion US dollars by 2035. And finally, uh, let's have a look at the uh, key events uh, for the industrial sectors. 
Um, Auto China, this is probably the largest single um, whole um, vehicle um, shows. Uh, the two alternative years between Shanghai and China. Uh, it's a 14 day event, massive. All the latest new vehicle releases will be on show there. Another one to point out, probably Auto Mechanica uh, in Shanghai in December, probably the single largest and well-known international automotive parts, uh, services and supply chain events. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we'll be involved in the China Industrial Green Development Forum in May in Guangzhou. And for healthcare and life sciences, a big one out there, probably the National China Medical Equipment Fair in May in Shanghai as well. So that's a very quick um, overrun of the industrial sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so now we're just moving on to technology and innovation with Tina. We'll also be talking a bit about um, South China, given you've heard so much about that during these talks. Tina. Thank you, Chris. And thanks to all of my colleagues to providing such a very like um, integrated introduction for the other sectors. So there are two main parts that I will be covering in the following presentations. The first part is the technology and innovation in whole as, as a whole. And the second part would be the South China part. As we all know that uh, the digital economy appears frequently on the press and um, documents recently in China. And now China ranked number two globally in this area with uh, more than four times booming during the past decades. Uh, next slide, please. So in China, uh, the technology ecosy ecosystem is actually um, including a lot of large giant companies, for example, Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com, NetEase, and um, ByteDance, such kind of large companies, which can generate a cluster of relevant um, technology companies uh, around themselves, as well as a lot of unicorn from, uh, from, from local um, support. For example, um, in China until um, 2022, we have uh, more than 200 unicorn in China, uh, was also ranking the second globally. Next slide, please. So in technology innovation, um, there are a lot of opportunities in various of um, areas, for example, digital platforms, as, as I just mentioned, and uh, smart cities, healthcare, um, online um, education, um, professional service, um, like remote offices, um, 5G industry, unmanded co uh, commerce and services, fresh food e-commerce platform, supply chain management, and manufacturing and service robots. First, uh, for all of those sectors, we have cross, like cross sector teams connecting with all of my other colleagues um, who just presented for their um, sectors earlier. So we will have a lot of like cross sector activities in the future, in the coming year. Next slide, please. Besides those opportunities, there are a lot of challenges and risks. Besides those um, like general uh, risks and challenges for all of those overseas companies, the IP data and cybersecurity laws in China would be those main things for the technology and innovation companies from the UK to China. Next slide, please. So for the next few parts, I will be um, covering some South China uh, elements. So about the Greater Bay Area, I'm sure that uh, a lot of you must be um, heard about this word, the GBA, for a few years. And for this cluster, it actually covers nine municipality um, um, cities in Guangdong province, plus Hong Kong and Macau. And um, as a very strong, um, um, economic and um, regional uh, cluster, the, the objective of this cluster is further deepen cooperation among Guangdong province, Hong Kong and Macau to like to make all of those industries can develop together across different cities and across different sectors. And there are some key policies and opportunities for some sectors, for example, innovation and technology, financial and uh, professional services, transportation and logistics, healthcare, life science, education, creative and arts, environmental protection and sustainability. Next slide, please. 
So CBBC will take some initiatives in the Greater Bay Area. And in November, we are planning to hold a CBBC Greater Bay Area conference. Um, at the meanwhile, we also um, we launch a CBBC GBA report. For all of these activities, you are welcome, uh, very welcoming to like take part in um, different um, methods. And um, you can connect with CBBC to hold events and to um, make some corporations, and then we can build these things up. And the next part is for the technology innovations. Uh, sorry. Um, next part would be the key events calendars for both South China and the innovation and technology sector as a whole. As you might see from this um, calendar, we will have a lot of um, technology relevant events throughout the year. For example, the World Internet of Things con 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 convention, which would be taking place, I think, just this, this month in Beijing. And there are a lot more um, like large events which has been um, has been holding for several years. For example, the um, Smart City Expo, although we don't have an exactly like date to be held in 2023, we will ha have some updating calendar um, afterwards and distribute it to all. And besides those ones, we will have um, like World Internet of Things um, exposition, and we will have um, Canton Fair, uh, Beyond Expo, CBBC International Innovation Hub events, Hong Kong Electronics Fair. For all of those events, we, uh, we will organize communications among technology innovation stakeholders and uh, all of those stakeholders in the other sectors relevant to those kind of um, events and facilitate communications between the organizers and our members to like generate some business leads and um, like business wings between our members and the local stakeholders. We will also organize our own events in South China, as I just mentioned, for the GBA conference. For such kind of um, like events and um, like activities, it would be important that if you can review all of those lists and register your in interest beforehand so that we can connect with you in time when we're planning all of those activities. That's all from my part. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for that, Tina. That was, uh, and actually all my colleagues, that was a, a lightning round of what CBC has planned and what, uh, what China has planned over the next couple of, um, next 12 months, in fact. Um, so now we've got a, a bit of an opportunity for Q&A. Um, I'd like to welcome Mark and Kieran back, um, if, if they are still connected, um, just for, for a Q&A session around some of the, the things that we've discussed today. Um, I'll get the ball rolling, Mark. And if anyone does have kind of questions, please do uh, use the Q and A function um, on the screen. Um, well, one question I had was just around tourism, and, and what are your thoughts around um, the, the kind of opportunities now that Chinese uh, nationals can leave um, mainland China, um, and particularly the comments around revenge spending? How much do you think of that? Four, four trillion dollars is going to be spent outside the country as opposed to inside. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Chris, good point. I, I think it could be quite a bit of that. Um, I think um, we can imagine you know, to see uh, overseas destinations ramping up again to welcome those Chinese tourists. Um, maybe initially it will be a bit closer to China, so Southeast Asia, um, Japan, and then um, you know, maybe later in the year we'll see people going to Europe. Depends on the availability of flights, I think, capacity. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that's something we are hearing a bit about. Um, Kieran, no, we've got a question here um, from the University of Warwick just around current lead times on UK visa applications for travel to China. Um, kind of what, what barriers are being experienced and any advice on how to circumnavigate those challenges? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, th I think in terms of planning ahead, you know, at least allowing for, uh, you know, six to eight weeks 
notice um, in order to, you know, have your visa issued would be sensible. Um, we, I mean, it's constantly evolving. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty sure that uh, timelines are going to uh, going to shrink and that, you know, we will gradually get back to, uh, to, to, to a mode of normality. But yes, I mean, I would, um, you know, I would advocate, uh, you know, getting dates locked in quickly, plans, uh, plans made ahead of schedule. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, that giving due thought to, to that when making applications. I know that uh, I'm aware of a couple of uh, executives that, that are currently going through the process. They had intended to be here already in China, but uh, because of uh, backlog capacity, Chinese New Year, of course, that we've just gone through, you know, that the, the, the ETA for an inward visit to China is likely to be more towards the sort of latter part of this month, um, as opposed to, you know, now. So, so yeah, just, just be cognizant of, uh, of that. And again, you know, we'll, we'll be updating our, um, our own sort of, uh, you know, newsletters and, uh, and our focus platform with updates um, on, uh, on this. So, so I urge you to, to keep your eyes and ears uh, attuned to um, our external comms on, on this particular issue, because we understand how, uh, how, how, how important um, it is um, to, uh, to, 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 to make things very clear. Um, our visa service, I should say, is very much uh, open and active um, with a very short lead time. So, you know, the quicker you get that uh, into us, the quicker you'll be able to progress your application with the Chinese embassy in the UK. OK, um, we've got a question. I suspect, Mark, you might be best placed to answer this one just around what opportunities to financial risk technology firms have um, to expand into China. Any, any thoughts on that one? Maybe they're referring to the uh, the regulations that came in last year against the big Chinese tech companies. Um, I think my comment there would be that my understanding is that late last year, again, I think it was post the reopening, there was relaxation around that. Um, you know, things like the uh, online education apps and, and website services. Um, but, but I think any foreign tech company needs to be careful because there's a lot of areas they actually can't get into. That's going to be on the negative list in some places like uh, owning an ICT license. You're going to need to work with a local partner. Um, I mean, just, just picking on that, that up on that piece around education, um, I mean, there's how have kind of the recent change, this is another question, so how have the recent changes in online education in China changed opportunities for UK providers? So obviously there was there was that crackdown that you mentioned last year. Um, yeah, maybe Kieran, you look like you're about to jump in there. Um, I mean, it's been a, a turbulent environment if you're a private educa um, education uh, business in China, irrespective of whether you're providing offline or, or online um, solutions. I mean, it's uh, again, uh, as uh, you know, as CBBC, we will try to you know provide the intel and the insight to to guide around this. But um, but yeah, it's uh, I mean, the way I I, I see it is it's. Uh, it's it's constant evolution, and uh, you know, um, Mark has uh, has already sort of outlined the context for uh, you know the, the 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 and and the rationale for why some of the you know some of these challenges, particularly in the in the digisphere, are uh, are are pertinent to UK businesses. Okay, um, just give a few more seconds in case any more questions come in. I am cognizant of the time that we have run slightly over um but let's just just see if we've got anything i mean maybe while we're waiting in, um maybe were there any kind of concluding remarks from, from either yourself mark or, or kieran just to kind of sum up your thoughts on on the next 12 months maybe kieran do you want to go first oh i was going to offer the floor to mark um go ahead go ahead mark yeah well, I, I, yeah i think i mentioned some points at the end of my presentation but uh, generally speaking, I'm feeling positive and optimistic, certainly a lot more than I was at the end of last year. Um, the geopolitics has to be managed. It's, it's, 
a risk that is still there and is top of the list when I'm talking to clients. They need reassuring about those factors. Um, you know, be it about Ukraine, be it about Taiwan, all of these things. Companies are very concerned. And uh, even if, if the Chinese economy totally takes off this year, there will still be a lot of questions about that. Just um, one kind of quick follow up on that point. You said that you've been in, in Europe. Have you noticed a difference in terms of um, kind of the pace at which people are, um, you know, so are our European cousins moving faster than than the UK companies? Are we kind of roughly in line with the pack? How, how, you know, it's, we don't want to we don't want to let the French get ahead. Okay, so I, how, I will answer going? that question open and honestly. Um, my meetings were mostly in the UK and Germany. Uh, the simple answer to the question is the Germans are right back on it and they're being a lot more pragmatic as a UK. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a challenge. Um, yeah. Kieran, Kieran, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think just to, to Mark's point there as well, you know, I think the onus is very much on us as well as, uh, as all, uh, all, all, bits, um, all consultants active in the space to really sort of guide on, uh, on China now and this, uh, you know, and, and, and the evolving environment to, uh, you know, to try and stimulate a bit more, um, you know, knowledge um and uh and proactivity around the market i mean uh, there's there's a lot of uh sort of political um sort of headwinds that we're working into both so both geopolitically and domestically as well um on china so you know the the the, the more um effective and timely uh, you know quality pragmatic advice can uh, can get into the hands of, uh, of businesses the uh, the better informed you will be to uh, you know to to make strategic decisions on uh, you know how you're engaging with uh, with with the market here so um i would just wrap up my sort of thoughts by um you know concurring very much with um you know the perspective put forward by mark you know my um, as you have seen, probably from my opening remarks, you know, I'm feeling very positive and bullish at the moment. I think that represents the organizational position as well of, um, of CBBC. Um, at the same time, you know, we do need to be cognizant of, um, you know, the fact that this is we are still very much working through a, a transition here from the, uh, the, the, the the dreaded zero COVID policy um, into, you know, a fully normalized environment there will be um potential sort of teething problems around that but uh you know certainly you know with travel routes opening up um now very rapidly and um an access to the market being uh at levels already that uh you know we haven't seen for for, for three years that in its own right is uh, is a great cause for uh for optimism um, for, for, for you and for, for, for all of us that are active in this, uh, in this space. So, you know, China, as I said, China is very much open and ready to do business now with the UK. The timing is absolutely right to be getting um, the, the, the question of China onto your, uh, onto your map if it isn't already. And should you have any questions that you want to follow up with Mark, myself, you know, other members um, of the team that have spoken today from CBBC, you know, please don't hesitate to uh, to get in touch with us. You know, we, we will make our slides available from from CBBC today so that, um, you know, you've got full access to, uh, you know, the calendars and the sort of general highlights that, uh, you know, our, our, our colleagues have made. Um, I'll put my address, you know, and the team's address details in there and um, and, and, and Mark, if you're if you wish your details to be shared, um, you know, we'll be happy to, uh, you know, to do that as well. Excellent. I think on, on that note, on a very positive note, um, let's, let's end there. Thank you both. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you all my, my colleagues um, around China, Mark, Isabel, Ran, uh, Tina, uh, and, and everyone else. Thanks Thank for you joining.